Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and jump into stability criteria. Basically, we're going to talk about the different types of structure or the different types of stability we consider, which include structural stability, vehicular stability, and also human stability. Uh, we'll talk about five different construction types that we consider specifically. We'll talk about two different vehicle types we consider specifically. Um, we'll talk about, as we have in every presentation, some of the limitations to this um, and special sort of considerations. So first we'll start off with structural stability. Um, and when I say uh, stability, basically we're talking about the threshold, right? And so we generate these uh, functions, which you'll see in later slides, that basically um, are depth and velocity functions to which we would basically sample those and say, okay, uh, for this particular structure or this type of structure, this particular individual, we are sampling their stability threshold. So the point where if the depth or the velocity exceeds that function, they have lost their stability. And for structures, that means the structure has collapsed, it's been washed away, and ultimately, that would put the people within that structure in the high hazard zone. So we talked about the fatality rate curve. So this all relates back to that, and we'll revisit that again. Um, and so why is this important? So the stability of this house in the lower left-hand corner is, again, much different than the stability of the houses in the top right corner. So the, in the top right corner, we've got a relatively very high depth, but it looks like relatively low velocities. So you might potentially be able to have people evacuate up onto that roof within their attic um, or potentially maybe even swim out of this area. Whereas in the picture on the bottom left, you see uh, the water sort of rushing by. The structure is on the verge of collapse and then also being washed away. So if there are any occupants within that building, that's clearly a very, very dangerous situation. So when we talk through structural stability, we kind of recognize, right, that what type of structure you're looking at, what it's built out of, like the construction materials, um, also other factors such as the weight of the structure. There's a lot of things that can go into what makes a structure stable or unstable. Um, and so we identified five sort of primary construction types and we sort of built um, life sim and our consequence modeling efforts around those construction types. So the first one is a manufactured home, it may look something like this, uh, think of your typical prefabricated prefabri prefabri home or modular structure, um, trailers, campers, things of that nature might, might fit in closely with this depending on uh, where they're located and if they've been put on a foundation and that sort of thing. Uh, then we've also got our typical wood frame structures, and this we sort of put into two different categories, wood buoyant and wood anchored. And so this concept is a little bit more difficult to grasp. grasp. Basically what we're saying when we say wood buoyant is we're saying there's nothing bolting the structure to the foundation. So where I'm from, rural Appalachia, most of the wood frame structures are probably not bolted to the foundation if they're even sitting on their foundation properly, right? And then wood anchored structures, this you would see more common in like a seismic area or also maybe somewhere that has like a lot of um, tornado type activities like tornado alley. Homes are typically anchored to the foundation. So when you're trying to consider like, oh, I can't really look at these structures foundations, kind of think of the context of where those structures are located. Um, and you can also a lot of times Google some quick like building codes for the area and that sort of thing that'll help you sort of answer this question. Next we have our typical masonry structures, stone or block. This is typically unreinforced. And then we've got, lastly, we've got our engineered structures. So that would include your steel structures or also your reinforced concrete structures. Um, keep in mind, uh, you see on this left, which they're clearly in construction of this particular steel structure, but this doesn't necessarily mean the walls are load-bearing. You could have a structure still standing, right? You could have the frame of the structure, but you still might have washed away all the walls, and you might have washed away all the contents within that structure. So that's an important thing to think about, even when you're thinking about structure has good stability, but am I in an area where I have a lot of steel frames and people within, within would still be in a high-hazard zone? So this is basically all, not all, the segment of the literature that we actually use to develop our functions for structures, there was a long list of 
literature that we reviewed um, and determined if it was a good fit or not. I shouldn't say a long list. As you can tell from here, there's not a lot, right? There's not a lot of data out there on stability in general, um, and especially not for each different construction type. So for our manufactured stability, um, we use the data from the Hazus multi-hazard tool. We just took what they used. I couldn't find exactly what their methodology was for developing their functions, but we took them and ran with them because we couldn't find anything else. Um, and we applied some uncertainty to that, which you'll see where we kind of did all that later. Uh, for wood buoyant, we had these three different um, these three different papers here. So black was actually black 1975 at all. They were more of um, a, a physical model, a, a scaled down model was what the basis of theirs was. Same with Dell. Dell et al. basically took the black paper and expanded on it to more modern structures. And then Sangri et al. or sorry, Sangri et al. expanded on black, expanded on the black paper. And then Dell et al. Um, I think theirs was more empirical in nature. Um, wood anchored, Galagos et al., that was basically a synthesis of 10 different um, methodologies that existed, so we used their most likely function. And then Becker et al., that one, um, that one was a computational model that they had built. And then masonry, uh, we used a Claus and Clark paper, and that was based off observational data. Um, and engineered, we only had um, some great work the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers did with absolutely no paperwork to go with it. So we just kind of took that and ran with it, and we had nothing else to really go off of for that. So if any of you are structural engineers or something of that nature, know some good stuff for this that I'm not tracking, would love to hear about it. Um, but having said that, so kind of using this literature review, we developed these stability functions. You'll notice on your left, or your X, your y-axis, you have your depth, and then on your x-axis, you have velocity. And so what you're looking at here, um, if you look at that blue line, that basically represents our sort of worst case. This was modeled as a triangular distribution, so that's pretty much your worst case scenario. So uh, lower depths and velocities can really lead to structural collapse. Then we've got our most likely, so all of our data is going to tend to that particular line in our function. And then the red line represents our best case sort of scenario. So the blue shaded area, that's all the uncertainty we have. We're like, it could be anywhere in between this range, somewhere in there. If we're below the blue line, we're assuming we're good to go. There's no structural collapse. Stability is maintained. Occupants inside can hopefully vertically evacuate if they have the ability to do so. And if we're above that red line, that is no fly zone. The structure has collapsed or been washed away all the occupants inside would be considered high hazard. And so we did this for all these different construction types. So this one was for wood anchored. For wood buoyant, we actually have three different functions. And that was because we recognized that weight of a structure can affect how buoyant a structure is, right? So basically you think you have this force, so you have water going against the structure that is on a foundation. And depending on how much that structure weighs, the force may or may not be enough to push it off, to knock it down, what have you. So given that, we developed three functions. The first one um, is this, this one that we're seeing here, which is a uniform distribution. We're saying our stability could be anywhere between these two bounds. And then we have one that is for our light wood structures. Now again, what is considered light versus heavy for a structure? Um, how do you define that? We came up with an estimate based off some of this literature. And I forget what exactly that number is. I'd have to look it up. There is a white paper that goes with all this, by the way, if anyone wants to get into the literature and take a deep dive. Um, but basically we developed one for light structures, and then we also developed one for heavy structures. And so what makes a structure light or heavy? So the materials that are used, you have a brick, uh, brick siding versus vinyl siding. Um, do you have an asphalt roof versus a clay tile roof? So all those sorts of things. So if you have no idea what sort of structures are in your inventory, you may choose to use the uniform distribution that has that full range. And if you're looking at homes where <clears throat> you have mostly like, you know, wood or sh single uh, shingles and then something like that, you might use the light. And if you have mostly 
uh, wood frame homes and then they have some heavier sort of siding, you might use heavy. So use your best judgment on that. And then next we have our masonry. Um, similar story here. I uh, won't bore you all the details, but, you know, keep in mind if you're above that green line, we're assuming that you are unstable. And then here we have one for engineered stability as well. And you'll notice this one was a triangular distribution and this one is uniform. And the way we came up with these different uncertainties for engineered is we used expert judgment and made a good guess. So um, these are all editable within LifeSim. So if you have better information in your study area or you have assumptions that you think make more sense for your structure inventory, um, these can be changed and edited as appropriate if you have more or less uncertainty. And then lastly, poor manufactured houses we have down here with very low stability. Um, and again, the whole concept here is if I am in a single wide versus if I am in a skyscraper, my stability looks very different. If I'm in a, a manufactured home versus a, a concrete home, my stability looks very different, right? So we're just trying to account for that within our modeling. And so why is this important? So just some fun videos here. I believe this first one, this was, I believe, in my neck of the woods in Tennessee. So here we have some manufactured houses floating down the river. And here, this was in India, in the, uh, I believe in the uh, Ganges River. You see this structure is just crumbling to these very turbulent forces. This one here is in Alabama. We've got lower depths. People are just wading in the water, just hanging out. No one's too concerned. And then here we've got these masonry structures that are put together, which also is something to consider. Maybe that makes them a little bit more stable. I haven't seen a lot of research on that. Um, but really turbulent water rushing through, um, and they're all still standing. So just kind of to help you visualize why this is important and how it may come into play. And so all this ties back, you saw this slide earlier with Jason, so this all ties back to our fatality rates. So basically what we're saying is if that stability threshold is surpassed, we are going to sample this blue function, which is our high hazard function. And if the stability of that structure is not surpassed, but it's, but it's gotten wet, so maybe if you have a low depth or a high depth, low velocity structures, um, still sanding, maybe we'll sample that low hazard. So it depends on the submergence um, as well of the people inside which curve this would sample, but basically we're trying to say, did the structure collapse and did it, did it float away or something of that nature? And if it did, automatically high hazard. So here's an example. This is from Malpasse. And what you see in this graph is each of those dots uh, represents a particular structure. Again, velocity, y-axis, depth x-axis. The orange line is using, uh, this was from LifeSim, a modeling effort we did to kind of test the sensitivity to the stability criteria. So orange line, we use the wood anchored stability criteria, and then the green line, we use the masonry stability criteria. And the reason we did this is because we weren't really sure what those structures were made out of. We were trying to model a case history, not a lot of data, um, we knew that some of the structures uh, were probably concrete and masonry just due to the location and kind of the, the construction practices of that time period. But we also knew there were some uh, military facilities nearby that were probably thrown up rather quickly and probably were more uh, similar to like a wood structure. So we were trying to see, well, does it even matter for our results? Which one we pick? Should we be testing? Should we be doing part, part structures this, part structures that? We we're just trying to figure it out. And so this is really interesting, right? So if you notice the space between that orange and green line, those are kind of all the structures we're not so sure, or, or, or all the structures where this could really make a difference, right? So anything above that orange line with the wood anchored stability criteria would be considered collapsed or washed away. Anything above the green line for the masonry would be considered collapsed or washed away. So this area in between, um, whether depending on which stability criteria we use, we would be sampling very different fatality rates for the people in those structures. And so how did this play out? So this is again some results taken straight from uh, LifeSim. On your uh, y-axis you have your total life, la life loss, life with the eyes, eyes, life, uh, life loss, and then time of day on the bottom. Um, so you've got uh, the orange box which is the masonry structures. 
And then the blue box, which is using that wood anchored stability criteria. So notice life loss, life loss is much higher for the wood anchored stability, wood anchored stability criteria than for the masonry criteria. So we're looking around, I don't know, 425 for that orange box versus 525 for the blue box. So about 100 people difference that we, I don't know why that keeps doing that, um, 100 difference between life loss there. So this is why this matters. This is why you need to pay attention to your structure inventory um, and the construction practices of the um, structures within your, within your zone. So moving on to human stability criteria. So again, we do the same thing. We develop these thresholds, these functions for human stability criteria, also defined by depth and velocity. And again, same story, this can have a significant impact on life loss. And so um, I believe the top one, that was from Hurricane Ida, I believe. And so you see this man's carrying his child through the water. People are just in the flooding, mind their own business, not too worried about their particular hazard. Um, in the bottom, I couldn't find where this actually was taken, but we've got a rescue happening. A man is in deep waters. Looks like there's a little bit of velocity going on there too, and he is clinging on. And so in the last one, we've got a man whose truck is going underwater and he is swimming. So the stability of all these individuals is very different, right? And so this is what we want to consider when we're thinking about what are the depths and velocities associated with our study area um, and how people might uh, behave within those conditions. So human stability research is a lot more exciting. Um, so basically, uh, this is some of a synthesis of some of the data we use to help us develop these curves. Um, notice uh, subject characteristics, they did have uh, children, they had adults, and they also had professional stuntmen, so that would be kind of cool. Um, and then they also had rescue workers that actually were dressed in their safety, or in their like uniforms and all the, with all their safety equipment. So they were testing a full range of stability here. Um, and they had them either stand, walk, or sit. They had them turn. They had them do all kinds of things. And they put these people in these flumes, actual people. I imagine they all just had their little life vest on in there. And, you know, they just sent the water in. And so they just started off slow, see how people react, crank it up a notch, send more water. So I would volunteer for tribute for this. I don't know if y'all would, but that sounds kind of fun in a controlled environment. So that's, that's what they did here. And based off of that, they came up with, this is a synthesis of a lot of those different um, research literature review uh, articles we had in the previous slide. Um, notice on the bottom around uh, point, a half foot or a half meter, we've got a limiting depth for children. Um, and then up at around 1.2 meters, we have a limiting depth for adults. Um, and let's see. The orange line, I think that's orange, um, in the middle is uh, sort of the recommended limit for trained adults. I don't know exactly what's trained adult. I guess the stuntmen and the rescue workers. Um, and so each of those different points represents a different individual within that specific, during that specific study. So each of those uh, dots represents an individual person. So basically this full sort of range here is what we use to help us develop um, our stability criteria within LifeSim. Um, important to probably note here, within LifeSim, we don't actually consider children separately from adults. Uh, the assumption would be that children would be with an adult, and so if I have my niece with me, I can hold her hand, I can pick her up, and as long as I'm stable, she's also stable. Again, this is kind of also one of those sort of limiting factors because there are situations where this wouldn't be true, right? Like think about a school. There's one, one brave soul for about 20 children, right? So how are they going to possibly wrangle up all those children, keep them all stable? Jason gave a good case study example earlier where nuns tried to tie the children to them using a rope, and that ended up being fatal across the board. So uh, important to keep in mind if you're looking at a, a structure inventory where you've got a lot of schools or you have a lot of daycares or you have some sort of um, after-school camp, something like that, to consider if you need to um, have special accommodations for the stability for those structures uh, within your area.
how is this sort of logic function in life sim? So first we ask, does a person get wet? Are they in the flooded waters? And if no, no problem. Uh, there's no hazard. If the answer is yes, we then ask, has their velocity been exceeded? So we would func we would sample on their, uh, in that function their specific stability. And if it is surpassed for velocity, then they are put in the high hazard zone. If not, then we look at their depth times velocity. If that's surpassed then, they go in the high hazard zone. If not, then we look at the depth. If the depth is um, exceeded, then we ask, can they swim? And we'll talk a little bit more about swimming in the next slide. Um, and if their depth is not exceeded, uh, they're in the low hazard zone. They got wet, but they're able to remain standing or, uh, or climb up on something or what have you to keep themselves out of the high hazard zone. Um, if you can swim, uh, you're considered low hazard. If you cannot swim, um, you're considered high hazard. So before we jump into swimming, let's talk about limited mobility. So they've alluded to this in previous slides. There's a lot of factors that can contribute to whether a person is limited mobility or not. Um, as we can see in the first image, this man in his wheelchair probably doesn't have the same capability as the people in the right-hand picture to get on a ladder, climb up, and stand there and wait to be rescued. Uh, these children, they may not have the ability to stand and walk through these waters as the caretaker that is with them has. So these are all important things to consider. There's other things that may come into play, which is physical fitness. Are you able, if you don't have that ladder, are you able to just do a pull-up and thrust yourself up on that ledge? Um, do you have an injury? Uh, maybe normally you have good mo mobility, but you've torn your MCL and now you're not getting around so good. So there's a lot of natural variability to limited mobility, right? And so we try our best to account for this within LifeSim using census data on ambulatory um, mobility, which is basically defined on if a person is able to climb or walk upstairs, or sorry, to walk upstairs with ease, I believe is the terms they use with ease. Um, and so if a person is not able to do that, then they would be considered to have limited mobility and there's good census data on that. And we define that for both under 65 and over 65 because we assume that as you age, your mobility may decrease. Um, and if you are um, an individual such as myself, maybe your mobility is better, maybe not, depending on the day. So swimming test, so only 56% of people apparently were able to pass the five course swimming skills, which included things such as treading water, uh, putting your face in the water um, without panicking, uh, swimming forward, getting in and out of the pool, um, and there's one I'm forgetting here. Um, but basically there was some research that suggested about half of the population can swim. And so what we do is once we've sampled a stability criteria for an individual, um, let's say for this particular individual, we sampled uh, their stability is at a depth of 1.6 meters and their velocity is at three meters per second. So anything above that, we're assuming they would lose stability. So they'd be in that red zone. Um, now let's say our actual depths and velocities for a particular event is 2.2 meters. So that's where that blue dot is on your screen and your velocity is 0.4 meters per second. So what's happened here is basically this individual has ended up in a situation where their velocity um, has not been exceeded, but their depth has. And so in this case, we would ask, can they swim or can they not? Um, and again, you know, I like to always think about this like, yeah, I can swim in a pool do I swim very great in the ocean? Not really, uh, especially if there's surfboards flying at my head, waves crashing. Um, so you got, that's why we have to consider velocity so much, right? A lot of people are able to stand in a pool and they may consider that swimming, but that's why all these sort of criteria um, are tested to help us really hone in on um, can people swim or not. Um, and so ultimately it results in this function for human stability. This is out of life sim. And so you're seeing that full sort of range uh, from that earlier graphic where we had um, trained work or limiting for trained working adults and up. 
Um, and I forget the one that the label that was below that. I guess it was like average people like me. So basically, this is that full range there. Um, and the blue area represents uncertainty. So again, um, we're assuming if we're below this blue line, everyone's good to go. Stability is not surpassed. And if we're above this red line, you have fallen over, you are in need of rescue. Um, and as Jason alluded to earlier, also well, not alluded to, he explicitly said, uh, we have case histories where people have s defied the odds and they have been able to survive very hazardous situations. So that's why on our fatality rates, um, we have we have modeled those situations. And then we also have people who have tripped and fell in the wrong place at the wrong time and lost their lives. So it's just important to also consider just because you're in a high hazard zone does not mean a person is necessarily going to lose their life. So moving on to vehicle stability, um, I can't remember where this image on the left is from. I think the one on the right is uh, from one of the hurricane events in 2017. Um, so again, very similar uh, to the previous ones we've been talking about. And we're looking at specifically uh, sliding, toppling, floating, stalling, um, which we'll see in later slides. So here's a synthesis of some of the research that went developing these functions. Um, Shanda et al. was basically a synthesis of several studies. Um, and then you'll notice there's a couple of theoretical studies down here. Martinez, um, Martinez and uh, Gomez, that was a another sort of synthesis of other literature. Um, and then they also did some uh, model physical modeling where they had uh, scaled vehicles, again, in sort of flumes, sent the, mo uh, sent the water down and to see what would happen. Here's some of the ones where they did that scaled modeling. If you notice, uh, like five or six lines down, it says vehicle orientation. So they did consider if the vehicle was perpendicular or parallel to the water and things of that nature. Um, as we know, where the engine is in your vehicle determines where it is most likely heaviest. And so that can influence how your vehicle uh, gets pushed around in water. So uh, from this research, they found these are sort of the main ways that a vehicle can lose stability. Um, as we all know, tires float, they have air in them. So again, vehicles are very unsafe places to be. Um, and then another option that we also consider is if you, your vehicle stalls, and we would consider that to be losing stability as well. So this is for low clearance vehicles. So basically we separate between low clearance and high clearance. So low clearance, think about like your Prius, high clearance, think about like your monster trucks. Not even necessarily monster trucks, I'm exaggerating for emphasis, like a normal truck or an SUV. Um, so this is all the results from that. You can see on the bottom here some different vehicles that they sort of tested this for. So everything from uh, Mini Cooper, I think, um, let's see, we've got Mini Vans. So they kind of had a full gamut here. And then for trucks and high clearance vehicles, uh, they've got everything from... Um, a tank, which you see in the second column, which is kind of cool, uh, versus like a Volvo and an Audi in those vehicles. So they considered, again, a full range of different types of vehicles and said, okay, uh, these all have similar sort of clearance. And so how would they be impacted by influences of water? And using that in life sim, we came up with these triangular distributions. The one on the left is for low clearance vehicles, and the one on the right is for high clearance vehicles. Um, and again, below that blue line, all is well. Above that red line, no good. Somewhere in between, questionable. So some considerations, uh, specifically for vehicles. So research shows that most fatalities do occur um, in vehicles. Turn around, don't drown. Um, anyone want to admit to having driven through flooded road before? No? I'll admit it, my family did it again. When I was a kid, the train tracks would get flooded. If it was uh, shallow enough, Steve Owen took us in the truck, and we went to school anyways. You know, it's like, I really wish 10-year-old me would have known what I know now. I could have made a really good argument for not going to school those days. But nonetheless, we went to school. Um, so uh, cars and truck stability is, are very different, as we've talked about. And this is why monster trucks was on my mind. So here you see like this. A uh, sports car uh, just kind of stuck, and this guy with his American flag just trucking on through, having a good day. Um, loading matters. So this is something we can't, uh, we don't necessarily explicitly uh, can like account for uh, how many people, for example, or how much they weigh, and any belongings someone has in a vehicle can 
uh, cause for more friction and less buoyancy. Um, so that's just something to consider. Um, maybe like your semi trucks or something like that, right? Like they may um, be less likely to float away than your typical sort of car. Um, again, cars float. This is in Waverly and basically what you see happening, a lot of cars got first washed into the river and then they got washed down the river. Um, and they just all sort of piled up at this bridge and you can see they're turned all sorts of different ways. Um, and of course, no one parked their car in the river that day. And then human stability um, is often better than vehicle stability. So this is really important to keep in mind. A lot of times you might see um, people have this notion that I'm safer in my car than on my own two feet. And so people get stuck in flooded waters and they'll just be sitting there waiting for someone to come get them. Other times you'll see people exit their vehicles, climb on top, walk through the water, swim away. Um, if you have the option, you probably should get out of your vehicle, right? Because I'm sometimes better on my own two feet than inside a car that is buoyant and can I don't have control over. At least I have control over myself sometimes. And then lastly, this stalling sort of application. Uh, vehicles may stall prior to losing stability. So this vehicle here, you can see it looks like um, in the middle, sort of behind, you see the tail lights there. It looks like he's just kind of hanging out. He got stuck in there. He's not really being washed away. His vehicle hasn't toppled over. Um, and then you see in the white vehicle, you've got people actually exiting the vehicle to get out. So if water gets in your engine, I'm not a mechanic, water gets in your engine, bad things can happen, right? And so you may just get stuck somewhere you don't really want to be stuck. So even if you think you can drive through flooded waters, maybe think again. And then lastly, there's a lot of other considerations and also sort of limitations to the life sim modeling we actually do. So for one, we don't necessarily account specifically for debris. Um, and as Jason said, this is kind of accounted for within our fatality rates anyways, because in a lot of those situations where fatalities happened, there was likely debris in the water. Um, but it's not something we explicitly consider, but it can make a huge difference. If you are downstream of this mess coming at you, that's a lot different than if I'm just looking at some gentle water coming towards me, right, with nothing in it. Um, again, I always like to put this in something easy for me to think about. I always think about the ocean. Again, if I'm in the ocean and I'm hanging out, there's some gentle waves, I'm good to go. If a surfer's coming at me and a surfboard hits me in the head, I'm probably not good to go. Um, water temperature. So this, um, I believe this one was in Alaska. And this is, you know, the water not only has debris, ice in it, but it's also frigid and very cold. So if you get stuck here versus if you get stuck in um, water in Sacramento, uh, you're probably not going to last quite as long, right? You're not going to be able to withstand those conditions as long to maintain your stability. Um, you're more likely to lose it more quickly. <clears throat> Um, duration, so consider uh, this man, he is, you see that he's getting a child rescued off the top here, um, and they're moving very calmly and quickly. So how much time does he have before his vehicle is just totally washed away? So for right, for right now, he's fine, but is he going to be fine five minutes from now, ten minutes from now? Is it eventually going to be enough friction to move that vehicle so it gets swept downstream? Um, and then we also have the consideration for coincident events. Again, this is not something we can directly, um, we do directly accommodate for within life sim currently. There's kind of workarounds if you want to get fancy. Um, but what happens to my stability if I also just experience an earthquake? So now my structure may already be compromised. Um, I may already be compromised. So do I, do, does the place that I am, is it able to keep me safe? Um, and how do I consider that? So again, if you're looking at a failure mode that is, has something to do with seismic event, this may be something to consider um, finding a workaround for in your modeling or at least qualitatively thinking about. Um, and then lastly, rescue. Again, not something we can't really model helicopters coming in. We don't know um, where emergency uh, rescuers will be, when and where, how they will get there, what resources every community has. And so this is something important to consider as well. There's a couple of studies out there that talk about, I think there's one specifically in Texas where they sort of talk about um, numbers of rescue per 10,000 people, um, swift water rescues across, I think, like 30 counties or something like that. So it's kind of interesting, but there's not just a ton of data on this, and it's not something we account for in the model. 
but something you should consider because I may have um, the expectation that I'm going to have a certain number of estimated life loss, but there is always the chance that someone gets rescued. Hurricane Katrina, we saw the sort of um, uh, individuals go out in their boats and actually start collecting people, collecting their neighbors, getting them all to save. And like, how do you count for that, right? How do you do, how do you determine if someone's going to make that attempt and put themselves in harm's way to to make this happen? So, having said that, that's all I've got on stability criteria.